We had an interesting morning report last week, and although I don't remember all of the details of the case, I thought it'd be interesting to share with you guys because there are a lot of good learning points with this case, and a lot of things that we don't necessarily see all the time as internal medicine physicians that is always important for us to keep on the differential. So to start off the case, uh, we basically had an elderly woman uh, with well-controlled lupus presenting with three days of altered mental status. Basically, she lives alone, um, wasn't really calling family for a while, and daughter came to check on her and found her just kind of like lying in bed um, and not really responding, slurring her words, things like that. And this is somebody who has a pretty normal baseline. For the past medical history, we don't really get too much. Um, we basically get that she has well-controlled lupus. She's not, e not even on any therapy for it, not even hydroxychloroquine. Um, so she's got the lupus, she's got some chronic low back pain, insomnia, uh, major depressive disorder. Past surgical history, family history, and social history are all pretty non-contributory. Uh, but then we get to the medication list, and there's obviously a lot of offenders here, which kind of raised a lot of red flags for people. So she was on citalopram, trazodone, uh, tramadol. Uh, Benadryl, and also Tizanidine. So immediately this sparks a lot of red flags for people because, uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of sedating medications here. Very clearly could be a cause of altered mental status in this older woman. Going on to the physical exam, um, you know, her, her vital exam uh, was kind of interesting. So temperature was fairly normal. Let's say she was 98.7 degrees. Um, her heart rate was uh, a little tachycardic. Uh, let's say she was 105. Uh, blood pressure, a little hypertensive, so let's say she was 150 over 100. And um, her respiratory rate was about 22, and so definitely breathing a little bit faster. And her O2 saturation was 96%. So doing well on that front. And then for his exam, uh, there were definitely a couple of notable findings that they found and actually documented in the history and physical. So in general, uh, elderly woman who just, you know, not really with it, learn oriented times one, maybe slurring her speech. So ANO times one slurred speech, but otherwise doesn't appear extremely toxic or anything. What they do notice is, however, that she does appear to have um, this erythema going on around her um uh, her cheeks and with the history of lupus this is obviously very concerning. Uh, one of the things we discussed was that lupus, um, you know, if it's well controlled, you really shouldn't be seeing a malar rash. And in these patients, um, you know, the presence of rash actually is something that the rheumatologists look for as a sign of active disease. You know, somebody's well controlled, doesn't have any rashes. All of a sudden they come in, they've got these new joint pains, new rashes, things like that. That's more of a marker that wow, the, the lupus is really picking up right now. So that's obviously very concerning. Also on exam, they found that she's kind of got uh, some mildly dilated pupils bilaterally. Um, really wasn't sure what to make too much of that, um, but that was kind of interesting. Um, and some pertinent negatives. So um, we asked, you know, did they check the reflexes? Uh, they didn't really check for reflexes. Um, and so that was kind of something that could have been useful potentially. Um, in terms of, uh, oh, I forgot on review of systems, she actually did mention some constipation uh, and that had been going on. But otherwise, no focal deficits anywhere. Heart and lung exams were normal and her abdominal exam was normal as well. So really, these were the two main findings that were concerning. So at this point, I think, you know, we have enough information to start forming a little bit of a differential diagnosis. So to start us off, you know, we've been talking about this already, but the lupus, it's apparently well controlled, but she's not on any disease modifying therapy for it. She seems to be coming in with this new malar rash. And one of the things that was very high on the differential would have been something like lupus cerebritis, especially being a morning report. Uh, morning reports tend to be uh, rarer conditions. Um, and so definitely this seems like it's fitting all the boxes so far, right? Um, definitely could present like this in terms of lupus cerebritis. And I mistakenly said that lupus cerebritis tends to be a little bit more subacute. Um, but then one of uh, my colleagues actually said that no, they've actually seen it present as a stroke before as well. So definitely lupus could present uh, acutely or subacutely. And in this case, you know, it's been three days. So that is about a, a pretty acute uh, presentation in this case. Now let's talk about some of her, her medications. We'd already kind of addressed the polypharmacy. And uh, it was noted that she's on multiple serotonergic uh, medications. So she's on citalopram, she's on trazodone, she's on tramadol. That's three medications that uh, 
have mechanisms of actions that involve the serotonin receptors. And so one of the things that's very, very uh, high on the differential is also serotonin syndrome. And so with serotonin syndrome, we've got a lot of other things that could be suggestive of this. She's got mild tachycardia. She's got hypertension. These are all features of uh, serotonin syndrome and altered mental status, right? Uh, unfortunately, like I mentioned, we did not check reflexes because typically what you would see is hyperreflexia. And what's specific about this kind of hyperreflexia is that it is more pronounced in the lower extremities greater than the upper extremities. So that's one little interesting thing to note about serotonin syndrome. And in the hospital as uh, internists, a lot of times we don't really check reflexes. But I think if it is on the differential, you can still check for reflexes even without a reflex hammer. Um, I've had many times where I've actually able to elicit reflexes just using my hands. You know, some people use the stethoscope technique as well, which neurologists will frown upon. But checking reflexes is always going to be better than not checking reflexes at all. So I think it is uh, worth putting into your repertoire. I'm not super great at it, but when I am able to elicit reflexes, I do feel like it is helpful. And so it's a good skill to practice. One of the things that we did point out is that she's not really hyperthermic. A lot of times with serotonin syndrome, you should see some degree of hyperthermia there. And so at this point, this was kind of our, our two biggest, um, you know, theories, uh, obviously just polypharmacy in general, she's on so many sedating medications. Um, and then going through the uh, missed mnemonic uh, for altered mental status, we discussed having a good approach or systematic approach to altered mental status. And I really like this one. So metabolic, infectious, seizures, structural, or stroke, um, and then trauma or toxins. Uh, that's really like a very good differential. And this is the uh, clinical problem solvers um, graphic for their missed mnemonic, metabolic infection, structural toxin. This is a kind of really broad overview of all the things you really should consider um, when you are thinking of causes of altered mental status. There are a lot of other mnemonics that people like to use, like vitamins, uh, move stupid, go times. These are all ways to just systematically make sure you're checking all the things uh, that could be going on here. And so another thing we did mention was the constipation. Um, and actually, she was on hydrochlorothiazide as well. Maybe she has hydrochlorothiazide. Maybe she was taking a calcium supplement and then ended up getting hypercalcemic, leading to altered mental status with constipation. So that was another thing. And yeah, I can add that here. She was on hydrochlorothiazide. And um, yeah, so hypercalcemia was definitely part of our uh, differential. And then infection, of course, as well. Now, in terms of the labs, um, we didn't really get anything too significant. Her CBC was fairly unremarkable. Uh, her BMP uh, did show an AKI, not too significant. I think her creatinine was maybe 1.6 or something. Totally reasonable in somebody who's been altered for three days, probably having poor PO intake. And she was found to have a metabolic acidosis. Uh, with a high anion gap. And looking into it, um, she was found to have ketones in her urine, so probably having a little bit of starvation ketosis uh, causing that anion gap metabolic acidosis. So obviously a patient coming in is gonna get a head CT, and so CT head uh, was negative, chest X-ray negative, UA negative for infection, blood cultures pending, but also negative. Uh, urine drug screen, also negative. Um, and so, all, so far, all of the workup has been fairly negative. So at this point, it's kind of um, a negative workup so far. It's like, oh man, what's our next step here? Um, do we need to LP this person? Or do we need to, uh, you know, get rid of her constipation? Maybe that's causing it. Do we need an MRI to rule out a stroke? Although she has no focal deficits, um, she does have some slurred speech. So maybe we need to just rule out stroke. Um, but let's bring us back to the uh, dilated pupils, because that's one thing that we haven't really addressed. You know, this could also fit with serotonin syndrome. Um, even in the morning report, we mentioned with serotonin syndrome, it's kind of like an overactivation of your sympathetic nervous system. And obviously, uh, when your sympathetic nervous system is activated, your pupils will dilate. Uh, whereas when you're relaxed, the parasympathetic uh, nervous system takes over and your pupils constrict. Uh, think about when you're in fight or flight mode, pupils dilate because you want all that light to come in because, you know, a, a tiger is chasing you or something and you want to be able to see as much as possible. That's why your pupils dilate when your sympathetic nervous system is overactivated. And so if you look into serotonin syndrome, you do see that you have uh, madriasis here, which is a dilation of the pupils, tachycardia, uh, and then you also get all of these things, altered mental status, autonomic hyperactivity, so rigidity, tachycardia, and hyperthermia of greater than 40 degrees Celsius, so very, very high temperatures, and then delirium, things like that. Um, so 
It could be. It could be due to that. But there was actually one more medication that kind of got overlooked because, uh, you know, it was just an as-needed medication. We didn't think too much of it. But after the patient was admitted, the family was called for some collateral information, and they realized that the patient had actually been taking a lot of Benadryl. And this actually showed up on one of the urine screens later that they, she had very high levels of Benadryl, um, at least from what I can remember. And so finally, we had our diagnosis, which was... anticholinergic toxicity. And this is something that they see frequently in the ED, but again, not something that we typically see a ton uh, as internists. It's just not, for some reason, they just you know seem to do better in the ED and maybe they don't get admitted to the hospital. But this is another reason we need to uh, go back to our mnemonic, right? And if you actually look on the missed uh, mnemonic here, we've actually got toxins here actually includes anticholinergic medications here. And you'll see here that this really uh, matches up a lot with her symptoms. She's got medriasis. She did have dry mucous membranes. She did have constipation, a little bit of tachycardia and altered mental status. Uh, notably, there's flushed skin here. And so what were we seeing with this rash on her uh, cheeks? This was not a malar rash. This was just skin flushing from anticholinergic uh, toxicity. And that was, again, like a little bit of a red herring. And I think in the morning report, they purposely used this image, which we all associate with a malar rash. I think, you know, for some reason, this picture of this lady is always the classic example of a malar rash. Um, but that was a nice little red herring there. But it was not a malar rash. It was actually flushed skin. And again, another learning point from this is, remember, we have a very good mnemonic for the symptoms of anticholinergic toxidrome. So you have hot as a desert, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, mad as a hatter, and red as a beet. These are all things that are describing what you would be experiencing with anticholinergic toxicity. So hyperthermia, dry mouth, urinary retention, and then you've got mad as a hatter, confusion, dilated pupils, medriasis, that's blind as a bat, and red as a beet, flushed skin. So why exactly does an anticholinergic toxidrome uh, occur? So remember, these are anti-muscarinic medications or anticholinergic medications. And what is the um, cholinergic or the muscarinic system used for? Those receptors are actually involved in the regulation of your parasympathetic nervous system. So when you end up having toxicity of your anti-muscarinic and anticholinergic medications, which are blocking your parasympathetic receptors. So now we're blocking the parasympathetic receptors. Now we are getting a sympathetic over-response, right? And because of that sympathetic over-response, we get hyperthermia, we get tachycardia, we get medriasis or dilated pupils, we get flushed skin. So that is exactly why we have this toxidrome that occurs with anticholinergic toxicity. This is in contrast to um, signs of cholinergic toxicity, which you can remember by the uh, signs uh, by the mnemonic of dumbbells. And so cholinergic, remember, this is going to be activating our parasympathetic. So now you're going to expect all of the things that you would find in, in a completely relaxed body state, right? So diarrhea. Your bowels are just going to start moving very, very quickly. Urination, meiosis, bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, lethargy, salivation. This is all due to overactivation of the parasympathetic nervous system. So remember, for the um, anticholinergic toxidrome, remember the mnemonic of mad as a hatter, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, red as a beet. And then for the cholinergic crisis uh, or toxidrome, the mnemonic for that is dumbbells. All right. Eventually, patient uh, was treated. Um, one of the treatments that can be given is physostigmine, uh, which can help reverse the anticholinergic toxidrome. I don't remember if this patient actually required it in the end. And also, uh, consulting toxicology is always warranted in this case because they are the experts in treating stuff like this. And so it would be very helpful to get them on board to help as well. So yeah, overall, a very, very interesting case, one that had some red herrings with the rash or actually just the flushing on the face, which thought made us think of lupus cerebritis or something like that. Then all of the serotonergic medications, which really stood out a lot more than the Benadryl, which was just kind of sneakily s snuck in there with, uh, you know, it was said as needed and just seemed like she was using it occasionally for allergies or something. But in the history, it ended up um, showing that she had taken like 10 uh, Benadryls for a couple of days for, for insomnia or something. Um, and that's really what caused this. 
And uh, just kind of going through the differential, you know, of having that dilated pupil. I think it was a very interesting presentation of this patient's altered mental status. The differential was very broad and ended up being anticholinergic toxicity. So definitely a very interesting case. One more little tidbit that I want to sneak in is that a lot of times in the ED, if somebody is coming in with a COPD exacerbation and they are getting duonebs uh, to help treat their wheezing, sometimes you're going to get called for a blown pupil. One of their eyes is just extremely dilated and the other one is normal. Um, and so what could potentially be a cause of that? And so this is something that's actually fairly commonly seen, but this is because the Duonebs has an anti-muscarinic uh, medication in it, the Iprotropium. And so if the gas is leaking out and touching their eye, it's going to cause the eye to dilate. And so everybody's going to freak out because they think it's a sign of a stroke or that the patient is herniating or something. The patient is just chilling there. They're like, hey, yeah, I feel a lot better. Like nothing's going on. Um, and so that as one more piece of information to add to your repertoire is that if you see one dilated pupil in somebody who's getting duonebs, it's most likely from the muscarinic antagonist, the iprotropium in the duoneb. And again, if somebody had a blown pupil, you would be expecting a brain herniation. And so if somebody's just chatting with you and just chilling there and they have one dilated pupil, uh, we just call that anisocoria. So just one dilated, like uneven pupils, but it's not, you know, concerning for a brain herniation. You don't need to call a stroke code because the patient's just chilling there and just doing fine. Uh, this is definitely an, a mistake that I made as an intern where uh, a patient was just chilling on the floor. They did have really low platelets. They were like a chemo patient or something. And nurse calls me, says patient, one of patient's pupils is like way larger than the other. And so we went over and examined him. He's like chilling there, but I'm like, oh my God, like hope he's not... I was like, oh my God, I hope this guy's not having a stroke or something. So I ended up calling a stroke code. Uh, everything ended up being fine. They said that in the end, it was probably warranted just because his platelets had been so low. So he could have had like a brain bleed or something. But maybe they were just saying that to make me feel a little better. Um, but in the end, they ended up looking back in the patient's chart and he ended up having a history of anisocoria, just a history of having one of his pupils a little bit dilated. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.